Welcome back to this session. Um, our next speaker will be um, Dr. Elizabeth Sherwood Randall, and I'm going to read her bio. Um, <laughs> Elizabeth Sherwood Randall has, been, has served as Deputy Secretary of the U.S. Department of Energy since October 2014. In this capacity, she's the Chief Operating Officer overseeing a diverse workforce of more than 100,000 people at the department headquarters, national labs, and sites across the country, and the U.S. missions around the world. Dr. Sherwood Randall has spent the majority of her career in public service, and her leadership role at DOE enables her to work on two major global challenges of our times, ensuring nuclear security and combating climate change. An additional priority she has emphasized at the Department of Energy is lifting up the work of dedicated professionals across the enterprise. She seeks to inspire the next generation to tackle hard problems and contribute meaningfully to the national security and economic strength of the United States and its allies and partners. Dr. Sherwood Randall joined the Obama administration in January 2009, serving through the president's first term as special assistant to the president and senior director for European Affairs and, national and the National Security Council. In 2013, she was appointed as White House Coordinator for Defense Policy, uh, countering weapons of mass destruction and arms control. In this, position, in this position, she served as the President's Sherpa for the 2014 Nuclear Security Summit in The Hague. Before joining President Obama's team, Dr. Sherwood Randall worked at Stanford University and Harvard University and the Council of Foreign Relations. In the Clinton administration, she served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia. During this period, she led the effort to denuclearize three former Soviet states, for which she was awarded the Department of Defense Medal of Distinguished Public Service. Early in her career, she served as the then Senator Joe Biden, Chief Advisor on Foreign and Defense Policy. Born and raised in California, Deputy Secretary Sher Sherwood Randall attended college at Harvard University and received her doctorate in international relations as a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford University. She's married to Dr. Jeff Randall, a neurosurgeon, and they have two teenage sons. Dr. Sherwood Randall, it's a pleasure <laughs> welcome you here. I need to send a shorter bio. Good morning, everybody. I am so happy to be here. Thank you, Dr. Jaffe, Peter, for welcoming me. Uh, and I have to say thank you, Dr. Tillman, Shirley, for asking me many, many months ago to come to this opening celebration uh, for this extraordinary center. I want to offer my thanks to Dr. Carter, Emily, for inviting me to speak today and extend my congratulations to her on becoming the next Dean of the School of Engineering. And also, congratulations to Dr. Lin Liu on the announcement of her new leadership role here. There's so much positive energy at this place. It's great. Uh, it is very meaningful to be a part of a celebration for such a beautiful new state-of-the-art building to focus on the challenging energy issues of our times. From the green roof and daylight harvesting systems to the heating and cooling, this is the physical embodiment of the goals that people working within this building are pursuing. So most people don't have an opportunity to work in a space like this, certainly not those in the forestall building of the Department of Energy. <laughs> I have to say, if you ever come to see us, we're in a um, Soviet brutalist building, is how I would describe it. And uh, we could use a little bit of the design of this space. I also was struck by the very powerful sculpture by Ursula von Reidingsvard out in front, and indeed my family has known Ursula for a long time, so it's very special to see that here. Uh, your work here, your research, and your activities are very much aligned with the Department of Energy's priorities. I think most of you probably know the Department of Energy has a long history of cooperation with Princeton University. Princeton professor Lyman Spitzer founded what is now our Princeton Plasma Physics Lab, which is home to the National Spher Spherical Torus Experiment and the Magnetic Reconnection Experiment. For those who aren't nuclear physicists, like Secretary Moniz, our Secretary of Energy, NSTXU is helping to advance research into developing nuclear fusion as an energy source. And MRX studies magnetic reconnection, which can help us to understand auroras and solar flares. 
in honor of the opening of your building and in anticipation of the work that you will do here, uh, some of it in continuing collaboration with DOE, I want to talk to you today about the President's climate agenda and about an exciting initiative that we have undertaken uh, called Mission Innovation. I'll also talk about how DOE is supporting innovation advances in science and technology that are crucial to meeting our climate and energy goals and the role that you can play in making those goals a reality. And relatedly, I'll talk to you about how we are developing regional energy partnerships that will make our climate and energy policies effective in the varied energy ecosystems across our nation. So to begin, in a speech at Georgetown University in 2013, President Obama presented his strategic vision for dealing with climate change. He said, we need to change the way we use energy in the United States. His climate action plan laid out a framework that involves using innovation to reduce greenhouse gas emissions while enhancing growth across our economy. The three-part framework includes, first, working to cut carbon pollution in the United States. Second, preparing our country to mitigate the inevitable impacts of climate change. And third, leading international efforts to combat global, global climate change. And we know that this won't be easy. Stephen Pakula and Robert Sokolo, the Princeton scientists behind the Carbon Mitigation Initiative, have estimated that we may be able to avoid dramatic climate change if we do not continue with business as usual and if we prevent the emission of more than 200 billion tons of carbon between now and 2060. They suggested 15 strategies, their famous stabilization wedges, that can help us to reach our climate goals. The best part of this is that we see from what they have demonstrated that we can reduce carbon by improving existing technologies, including by increasing fuel efficiency for cars, by broadening deployment of carbon capture and storage for fossil fuels, and by scaling up the deployment of renewable energy resources. In other words, innovation is the answer. Secretary Moniz likes to describe the Department of Energy as the nation's science and technology powerhouse. And innovation is our lifeblood. We perform cutting edge science that's helping to do what Pakala and Sokolo recommended and therefore transform our energy sector and reduce our carbon emissions. And we've already seen dramatic success over the last few years, just in the course of this administration. We've achieved efficiency improvements across our economy in appliances, vehicles, buildings, and manufacturing that have cut growth in energy consumption to almost zero. Emissions have declined by 15% since the peak levels of 2007, and our energy landscape is changing rapidly. We're now the world's largest combined producer of petroleum and natural gas, and we're poised to become a major exporter of natural gas. This has had profound effects on our economy. It stimulated industry and contributed to significant declines in carbon emissions from our electric power sector already. Renewable energy deployment is also increasing across the country. 67% of all new electric power generation capability has been construct that was constructed in 2015 came from wind and solar. In 2014, all new generation capacity installed in New Jersey came from solar PV. All of this new growth across the country has led to more than 200,000 jobs in the solar industry just since 2010. This means that there is a growing need for a trained workforce for all of these new jobs, a sector that's growing at 20% per year over the past few years. So DOE is also helping to ensure that we have the skilled workforce necessary to meet the demands of a clean energy economy. For example, on Tuesday, I announced that five new military bases, including Joint Base McGuire-Dix-Lakehurst here in New Jersey, will participate in our pioneering Solar Ready Vets initiative that trains service members transitioning from active duty to veteran status for jobs in the dynamic solar industry. And we expect these encouraging trends to continue. Congress recently passed a five-year extension of tax incentives that could lead to the deployment of 53 gigawatts of renewables by 2020, enough to power about 14 million homes. But preventing emissions is only part of our fight. 
We also have to ensure that our energy infrastructure, especially for our electric power sector, is better prepared for and more resilient to the effects of climate change, which we cannot avoid, such as more intense storms, other extreme weather events, drought, and higher sea levels. The benefits of a flexible and resilient energy infrastructure were conclusively demonstrated right here at Princeton. In 2012, just before I came to the Department of Energy, millions of people were without electricity in the aftermath of Superstorm Sandy. And your microgrid ensured that your campus still had power and that first responders and local residents had a place to get warm and recharge. I'm looking forward to seeing that plant, the cogeneration plant, here on campus later this afternoon. So this quick summary gives you the basics on how we have done our part here in the United States over the last few years, but that will clearly not be enough to change the fate of the planet. Climate change is a problem that is beyond the capacity of any one country to solve, and as I noted, the Climate Action Plan includes a very important dimension involving international action. Last December in Paris, the United States and more than 190 countries committed to ambitious targets for emissions reductions. The United States committed to reducing our national carbon emissions by 17 percent below 2005 levels by 2020 and by 26 to 28 percent by 2025. And on Earth Day, April 22nd last month, Secretary Kerry and 175 other world leaders signed the Paris Agreement at the United Nations in New York. Since then, two more countries have signed and 16 more have deposited instruments of ratification. This record number of signatories on the first available day demonstrates how seriously the international community is finally taking climate change. We'll need to take aggressive action, however, to meet our climate commitments, including, most importantly, by accelerating the pace of research and development. Because we will need to make our existing clean energy technologies cheaper, more efficient, and more widely deployed, innovation is essential. The International Energy Agency estimates that meeting global emissions targets will require a $13.5 trillion investment in clean energy and energy efficient technologies between now and 2030. And that means we have to increase funding for innovation to meet the challenge as well. So that is just what leaders did in Paris on November 30th, the first day of the climate talks. President Obama and 19 other world leaders launched something called Mission Innovation, a commitment to double government investments in clean energy research and development over the next five years. Our investments will accelerate global clean energy innovation and dramatically expand the development of technologies that will ensure our global power mix is clean, affordable, and reliable. Collectively, mission innovation represents an extraordinarily diverse group of countries. The coalition includes the world's largest emitters of greenhouse gases. Partners span five continents and represent nearly 60% of the world's population, including the five most populous countries. We're some of the world's largest oil and gas producers, and we're also among the countries that get significant percentages of our power from renewables. And most significantly, Mission Innovation Partners already account for more than 80% of governmental support around the world for clean energy research and development. So that means that partner countries are not starting from scratch. We already have made a substantial, established a substantial innovation baseline, and we've been thinking creatively about designing R&D programs to meet these challenges. We alone in the United States make up half of that mission innovation total. Doubling the current U.S. annual federal investment would take us to $12.8 billion for R&D for clean energy in, by 2021. And investments made around the world will help us to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions, enhance energy security, create opportunities for energy businesses in a gl global marketplace, and help provide affordable clean energy to consumers. Most important, this will create a major expansion of the global innovation pipeline. Domestic implementation of mission innovation, including at the Department of Energy, will follow what the President calls an all-of-the-above <coughs> strategy, focusing on low and no carbon technologies. It will include renewables, nuclear power, carbon capture and storage for fossil fuels, and energy efficiency, 
And there I want to stress the very important point. When we talk about clean energy and clean energy technology, people think we're only talking about renewables. That's not the case. Clean energy technology is any technology at any stage of the energy cycle that helps us to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It can also help us to reduce the demand for water, reduce waste, or improve air quality. So it's very important to note that this is not about eliminating the use of important fossil fuel resources, but we are talking about significantly reducing the carbon emissions that are associated with the use of those fossil fuels so that they can remain part of our low carbon energy mix. And this is because we, like many mission innovation countries, will need to use an energy mix that includes fossil fuels, at least in the near term. The Energy Information Agency predicts that even with growth in renewables and nuclear, most of the world's energy will still come from fossil fuels in 2040. So mission innovation partners are free to develop the clean energy solutions that best fit their domestic needs. And that was very important to motivating action. For example, power sectors in India and China are expected to drive 60% of the growth in carbon dioxide emissions through 2040 because so much electrification still needs to happen. Those emissions will come mostly from coal-fired power plants. So the freedom to innovate across a broad range of technologies is especially important for countries that are seeking to give more of their people access to clean and affordable power and also drive economic growth. President Obama has observed that no country's leaders should feel that they have to choose between uplifting their people economically and preserving the planet. Mission and Innovation's all of the above approach means that the possibilities from batteries to biomass and from carbon capture and storage to wind and solar are nearly limitless. And so are the opportunities for American businesses and innovators. We already know that sustained support for research and development will lead to results, including the rapid advances we're seeing today in some energy technologies. For example, between 1975 and 2008, the Department of Energy invested $4.1 billion in PV technology research and development. From 1976 to 2014, we invested $2.4 billion in wind, leading to key improvements in the available technology. The end result is that a range of clean technologies have rapidly become available, more cost competitive, and widely used. Costs for wind, solar power, and LEDs have dropped enormously just since 2008. Wind dropped 40%, distributed PV has dropped by 52%, and the cost for LEDs has dropped a whopping 90%. Meeting our climate goals will require that more technologies like these become more cost effective and widely deployed. So we have to discover these new clean energy technologies of the future. As we ramp up U.S. government investments, DOE's network of 17 national laboratories will expand their work across every part of the innovation chain, from fundamental and applied science to the development, demonstration, and deployment of new technologies. At the beginning of my remarks, I mentioned the fundamental research that we have been conducting at PPPL. We're also performing cutting-edge fundamental science research across the DOE enterprise that has advanced our understanding in areas including matter and energy, chemical processes, and environmental and climate systems. For example, researchers at Lawrence Berkeley Lab in California have found that bacteria that get their energy from sunlight have a protein that shifts colors from orange to red to dissipate excess energy as heat, protecting them from too much sunlight. This finding could have implications for scientists working to develop artificial photosynthesis. The National Synchrotron Light Source at Brookhaven National Lab in New York uses X-ray imaging so researchers can study materials at nanoscale. The knowledge and understanding that we gain from their work could lead to materials that, among other things, transmit electricity with greater efficiency and less heat. Our Office of Science supports fundamental science research here at Princeton, including by scientists working in plasma physics and fusion energy at PPPL, as I noted, and I see Stuart Prager sitting in the audience, across a broad range of fields such as material science and chemistry as well. This work will help lay the groundwork for advances in clean energy and other technologies. DOE has also partnered with Princeton researchers in three of our Energy Frontier Research Centers. These centers gather some of the best scientists in the country to conduct fundamental research on grand challenges, 
chosen by the scientific community. The challenges include improving our understanding of underground CO2 storage systems and developing a better understanding of materials that have the potential for clean energy technologies. DOE's labs are also applying what we've learned to everything from designing better wind turbines and more efficient batteries to exploring space. Our full-scale test bed at our Idaho National Lab allows us to improve grid resilience by testing scenarios for everything from cyber attacks to severe weather. And our cooperation with universities and industry in applied science is helping advance the state of the art in energy and clean technology. For example, the Carbon Capture Simulation Initiative develops and deploys computational tools and models that help researchers improve carbon capture and storage technologies. The simulation tools in the CCSI toolset help end users reduce the risks associated with design and technological innovation. And it's important to reduce these risks because getting new and improved technologies out of the lab and into development and deployment is the only way that we will meet our climate goals. Sometimes getting technology through the infamous valley of death and into the markets is one of the more frustrating parts of the entire process. So we're working hard to make that step easier. Dr. Ellen Williams, our director of our Advanced Research Projects Agency, ARPA-E, was here yesterday. Um, for those of you who weren't able, able to hear Ellen, ARPA-E funds transformational energy projects at the early stages before private sector investment is a realistic possibility. Uh, Dan Steingart also mentioned collaboration with ARPA-E. The program has been around for less than a decade, but in that time we've invested approximately $1.3 billion in more than 475 projects. 36 of those projects have formed companies, 60 have partnered with other government agencies, and 45 have, re have received an additional one and a quarter billion dollars in follow-on funding. We funded seven projects here in New Jersey, including two here at Princeton. Both of those were awarded to the Anliger Center's own, Dan Steingart, who spoke earlier, as I noted. Until now, we've only been able to fund about 2% of the proposals we receive, and that tells you how much appetite there is for this support to get through the valley of death. And that gives us an acceptance rate that I think is even lower than Princeton's admissions office. <laughs> Early stage technologies like the kind that ARPA-E supports have a higher ratio of risk to reward, obviously, than many other investments. And we really want to help get new technologies out to market. To speed up that process, we have also established a new Office of Technology Transitions, just created last year to license DOE laboratory technologies with commercial potential to private companies for further development and deployment. When I was leaving the White House, one of the things the President said to me was, I want you to go over to DOE and lift up all the great work being done in your labs and bring it forward to the benefit of the American people. And that's just what something like our Office of Technology Transitions is trying to do. Here in New Jersey, we're already working with 35 different partners, including businesses and universities, on 49 technology transfer agreements worth several million dollars. When commercial and utility scale technologies get to the point where they're ready for wider deployment, however, it can be even more difficult to secure financing. So our loan programs office works to accelerate the deployment of clean energy projects and technologies at the commercial and utility scale. The loan programs office provides loan guarantees or direct loans to eligible projects and manufacturers. The office manages a portfolio of more than $30 billion that helps support innovation, grow our economy, and advance our clean energy goals. For example, six years ago, there were no utility-scale PV generation facilities larger than 100 megawatts in the United States. LPO helped to finance the first five of these projects, providing $4.6 billion in loan guarantees and transforming our solar industry. Since then, the private sector has stepped in and financed another 28 utility-scale PV projects, adding another, another 5,300 megawatts of clean solar energy to our grid. According to the Solar en Energy Industries Association, that's enough power power almost 870,000 homes. Loan guarantees to Georgia Power Company and Oglethorpe Power Corporation are also supporting the construction of the first new nuclear reactors in the United States in more than 30 years. 
This reflects the need for capital investment in technologies both in the early stage of development and in deployment. In the coming years, our private sector and the private sector around the world will need to play an increasingly important role in delivering new technologies to market. And that's why a complementary but separate initiative was also launched in Paris last winter. Led by Bill Gates, the Breakthrough Energy Coalition is a group of 28 private investors and the University of California system. These investors banded together and agreed to mobilize private capital, including a billion dollars from Bill Gates and at least a billion from the rest of the group, over the next five years to make patient investments with a longer-term view, heightened risk tolerance, and a willingness to carry the most promising technologies from the lab to the marketplace. As we work to expand the innovation pipeline, we also need to think about how innovation fits into the broader energy and policy framework in the United States. Each region of our vast and diverse country has its own energy and innovation ecosystem with characteristics that are based on local conditions and institutions. As a result, we can't apply a one-size-fits-all approach to policy and innovation. So as we ramp up our fight against climate change, we know that centers like yours, where you understand the science and the policy, must work hand in hand, could serve in invaluable leadership roles in the development of regional innovation partnerships. As part of our commitment to mission innovation, President Obama has requested in the FY 2017 budget $110 million in funding for up to 10 regional clean energy innovation partnerships. The objective of these partnerships would be to bring together regional players in the innovation ecosystem, including research universities, government, industry, and private investors to generate portfolios of issues tailored around regional and local needs. These could include supporting the commercialization of clean energy technologies, economic development, and manufacturing. Because planning, priority setting, and research and development would be regional, clean energy programs could be more closely integrated with state and local economic development programs. This bottom-up approach would help us to address past criticisms of federally funded research and development, namely that it hasn't been connected to state and regional needs. Our goal with these partnerships is, again, to expand and accelerate innovation and commercialization by creating and strengthening connections among regional players. For example, California has been at the forefront of climate policy for many years. It's also, of course, a hub of innovation and has built a thriving innovation ecosystem. Last week, I visited UCLA, where I met with a dynamic and collaborative group of representatives from all over Southern California, including multiple universities, state and local government representatives, utilities, and private investors. Their goal was to discuss immediate needs and challenges and how they could focus their efforts on meeting them through cooperation, innovation, and policy development. This is the kind of cooperation that could serve as, model, as a model for other regions of our country. Princeton is also, as you heard earlier if you uh, were listening to the uh, previous remarks, a vibrant example of how more local planning and solutions can be put into practice. Uh, Dr. Carter noted that you have turned your campus into a living laboratory where you have tested out new technologies, monitored the, en monitored the energy efficiency of your buildings, and put theories for reducing energy use into practice. And I understand that the next speaker, Forrest Meggers and his team, have been involved in this effort. Your center, with its collaborative cross-disciplinary approaches, supports the spirit of creativity and cooperation that will make such a big difference for the next generation. And I want to just pause and speak about that next generation for a moment. I spend a lot of time going around the country, and everywhere I go, I talk about how crucial it is for young people to get an education in science, technology, engineering, and math. So I want to thank everybody here who plays a role as a mentor to students for your work to inspire Princeton's students, especially the undergraduates who have not yet chosen a career path encouraging them to pursue careers in STEM, or at least to get a solid STEM foundation, even if, even if they pursue a career on a different path. Because as I know well, we don't just need scientists, we also need policymakers. 
and best of all would be a skilled policymaker who's comfortable speaking the language of science and technology. It's a hugely important asset to any organization and will only grow more so in the decades to come. In our current cabinet, the Secretary of Energy and the Secretary of Defense both have degrees in nuclear physics, and they are living proof of how valuable their scientific foundation is to effective advancement of public policy goals. I can also say from personal experience that had I known where my career would take me, I would have definitely studied more science and math when I was in high school and college. I would recommend to all the students here at Princeton, no matter what their program, that they need to get a thorough grounding in STEM, even if they don't think they'll use it directly. <laughs> because science and technology are so central to everything that is happening on our planet. And that knowledge can only be beneficial to future policymakers, economists, business people, historians, uh, all those who will contribute to shaping our future. And there's no better time to really focus on these opportunities than when you are free as an undergraduate to range widely, explore new topics, and have access to extraordinary scientists and teachers and role models. You have examples here at Princeton sitting in the front row in Dr. Carter and Dr. Tillman, of course. Uh, and I can only emphasize how important it will be for you to continue to lead the way to guide and mentor those who will carry out our work and to uh, uh, do what Princeton promises in its motto, which is to carry our work forward in the nation's service and in the service of all nations into the future where they will need to continue to discover the solutions that will allow us to meet the challenges that we will face. Thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to speak today, and I'd be happy to try to answer any questions that I might be able to answer. Hans Meerman, postdoc at the Ennington Center. Um, I look at biofuel production, and one of the things we see is that um, to the grow the biomass, we look at non fossil like forest residues. Um, you have collaboration where you have a um, um, where you have a forest now. So it's not just that the biomass is used as an energy source, but it's a recreational source. And usually that's not integrated in any economic study when they look at the, the cost of the biomass. Is the Department of Energy looking at the other departments on how to combine different aspects uh, in that sense. I'm so sorry. I'm not sure I understood your question. <laughs> Ellen, did you? Either, so okay, well, part of it, we certainly work with Yeah. Incorporate ultimate land use as a biofuel. Yeah, so we do that. I'm not sure we've worked, um, and I think we do work a little bit with the interior on forestry uses, but not extensively yet. So. And I'm not sure that we've actually looked at the recreational uses at all, um, but we can find out. National parks, yeah. that's an actually a very interesting question. But we do continue, of course, to invest significantly in doing work on biofuels and their potential more broadly. Thank you. All the way back. You mentioned um, a lot of work. Who are you? Who are you? Oh, I'm, I'm a, a graduate student in the Department of Chemical Engineering. What's your name? Sarah. Hello, Sarah. Um, you mentioned a lot of the climate action plans that President Obama has put it forth um, and some of the more recent one-year plans. With the upcoming presidential election, do you see the trajectory of the DOE's energy plan changing, or is it kind of separate from um, well, I would say that one of the most important things we're seeing, and it's, it's a reason that I cited so many statistics, even though I'm not a mathematician, is that change has happened in a way that is driving economic growth, and our private sector has embraced the opportunity of clean energy solutions. And that's really the engine. So once we make this good for business, which is proving to be the case, then we don't have to drive this through public policy. It, these technologies will grow because there is benefit to be seen. And if you look at a company, I noticed on a um, list of support to, uh, in your uh, center, the Southern Company is a good example of a traditional power company that has now uh, 
uh, looked to branch out to do a great deal of work in renewables uh, and in carbon capture utilization and storage down at a place called Kemper in Mississippi. They see the future coming, and in order to be successful in a competitive economic environment, they have to move out in front. And so companies, utilities, and uh, investors are all recognizing that this is the place to move. Um, of course, public policy can change. And we have a discussion every year with those who fund our work about whether they will match uh, our requests with the support that we have asked for. And uh, one of the things that we have seen is growing support across the aisle for a number of the department's initiatives to generate jobs and growth in the economy and advance innovation. That's really quite bipartisan. So I'm fairly confident that much of the work we have done will be sustained uh, because it's to the benefit of the American people and the world. Hi, thanks for that interesting talk. I'm Denise Masrell, joint between Civil Environmental Engineering and the Woodrow Wilson School. Uh -huh. And um, I was wondering, as you pointed out, the developing countries are industrializing quickly and they're likely to increase their emissions very dramatically going forward. Is DOE involved in some ways in technology transfer so we can take some of the innovations from the United States and distribute them? More this broadly? is a huge part of our work. A DOE is sort of the Department of Energy, of everything, not just energy, but everything. <laughs> Most people don't know all the things that we do, and we have an extensive program of international cooperation to assist partners around the world with deploying clean energy solutions. And when we do that, we try to bring American businesses to the opportunity. So, for example, to meet the very ambitious climate goals that we uh, agreed to uh, with China. The president went to China in uh, the winter of 2014 and agreed with um, President Xi on, on targets that really drove the kind of ambitious uh, multinational commitments you saw in Paris. Uh, following on that trip, I went to China with the Secretary of Commerce with 24 American clean energy companies looking for opportunity to take advantage of the Chinese market, which is huge. And we brought a wide range of solutions, waste treatment, water, dealing with carbon emissions, uh, bus companies for cities that need to convert to natural gas power for their buses, enormous variety. And uh, <coughs> these opportunities are superb for our businesses, uh, and they're also very important to achieving our climate goals because we are on the frontier of innovation. And so we work very hard to identify ways to motivate other countries and then support them with the innovative solutions that our industry can uh, deploy. And we're doing that in, in many places. We do it with countries that are heavily fossil fuel dependent, like Saudi Arabia. We do it, uh, as I noted, with China, uh, which will continue to burn coal, but is also building lots of nuclear. Uh, and we do it with other countries uh, in, in places that are, are facing severe challenges on the um, energy, energy capacity and generation front and would likely use very uh, dirty sources unless we can help them. Thank you. I understand you have a meeting with um, Shirley Tillman. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll stop the questions I here. will be here for lunch, though. You I'm can, not going to uh, escape. And I'm so happy to be a part of this celebration. Hope to stay in close touch with the center and, and contribute in any way I can to your progress, because the partnership is so important to us in generating those solutions. So really, you can hear from what I said, and I think your question on the, on the international space is a very good uh, way to close, because in order to get to where we need to be, we need so many ideas to be had and proven. And so listening to Dan with his five companies, and they're viable but not profitable, I mean, we've got to get them to be profitable so that, so that the solutions that we need in the United States and around the world will be available for future generations. And, uh, if I were, I would say that in addition to studying science and math, if I had the brain power to be a Shirley Tillman or an Emily Carter, I would choose to go down that path because you can make such an enormous difference for the future of the planet in doing the kind of work that's being done here today. Thank you. <laughs>